In this video, we're going to look at maxima and minima problems in two or more variables. We're going to apply the second derivative test to find the to determine whether or not the critical points are local maxima, minimas, or saddle points. And then we're going to examine the critical points and boundary points to find the absolute extrema. So let's do a warm up where we are in one variable. To find the critical points, we know that we do the derivative f prime of x is equal to 5x to the fourth minus, uh, let me see, 16x cubed plus 9x squared. Now, to find the critical points, I would go ahead and factor this. So I'm going to factor out an x squared, leaving me the 5x squared minus 16x plus 9. And then I'd find factors of uh, 9 and 15 that add up to 16. And if that didn't work, then I would use the quadratic equation. Now, my critical points would come from wherever this x squared is equal to 0 and where the 5, 5x five squared minus 16x plus 9 is equal to 0. So these would be the places of my critical points. When we are looking at critical points in three, two or more variables, we're going to do something similar. We're going to first find the derivative. And we're doing the partial derivative, and then we set the partial derivatives equal to zero. These will give me my x and y points. So let's start out with the partial derivative. Partial derivative with respect to x is going to give me um, 2x. And then my partial derivative with respect to y is going to give me 2y. I'm going to set this 2x equal to 0, and so I get x is equal to 0. I'm going to set this 2y is equal to 0, and I get y is equal to 0. So my critical point here, critical point here, is just going to be the 0, 0. I have no other critical points. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, I'm going to do the partial derivatives with respect to x. So partial derivative with respect to x is going to give me 3 times 5, which is 45x squared. And then I have minus... 3x, and I'm going to do my partial derivative with respect to y, which is going to give me uh, negative 3x plus 45y uh, squared, and this first one should be y, not x, so y here, not x. Now, we have 45x squared minus 3y is equal to 0. We have negative uh, 3x plus 45y squared is equal to 0. I have two equations, two unknowns. I could solve for x and plug that into the other one. We'll do that. Let's go ahead and solve for x in this equation. I think before I do that, though, I'm going to go ahead and reduce both of these equations by a factor of 3. So I'm going to divide everything by 3, so I get 15x squared minus y is equal to 0. And this other equation, I'm going to have 3x, so I'm going to divide this by 3. So I have negative x squared, so negative x plus 15y squared is equal to 0. That way I can just work with smaller numbers. Okay, so from this equation, I've got x is equal to 15y squared. So wherever I see x, I can replace it with 15y squared. So I have 15, 15y squared, um, the quantity squared, minus y. And so then I'm going to get is equal to 0. And then I'm going to get, uh, let me see, I'll factor out a y leaving me 15 to the third, y raised to the, let me see, that's 4 minus 1 is 3, uh, minus 1 is equal to 0. So I've got, this gives me y is equal to 0. And then this one, I have 15y cubed, 
For 15 cubed, y cubed minus 1 is equal to 0, so y is equal to 1 over 15. And that's by moving the 15 to the cube to the other side, moving the 1 to the other side, and so adding 1, then divide by 15, and then taking the cube root, so I get those two numbers. Now, these are my y values. I need to go and put this y value into here. So when y is 0, x is 0. That gives me that one. And then when y is 1 fifth, 1 fifteenth, so when y is 1 fifteenth, and put that in here, I'm going to get 15 times 1 fifteenth squared. So it also gives me 1 fifteenth. So these are my two critical points. So what I did was I found the partial derivatives. I set each one of those partial derivatives to zero and I solved. I got two equations with two unknowns and I did it by substitution. And then by substitution, I found y values. And I put the y values back into one of the two equations to find my x values. And so those are my critical points. Now, when I'm trying to determine whether or not my critical pro points produce a local or relative absolute maxima or minima, one of the things that I can do when I'm in, two, in one space where I have one variable is by looking at the sign chart and or by looking at our um, second derivative test. So let's go ahead and we know our critical points. I don't think I finished it. I know that when I did my, my derivative here, I ended up with 5x to the 4 fourth, and then I had minus 16x squared, or cubed, and then plus 9x squared, and I factored out the x squared, and um, I ended up with, let me see, I had um, 5x squared, and I didn't finish this, plus 9, and uh, let's go ahead and factor this, so we have 5x and let me see, does this one factor 5, um, 9, and nope, this does not factor. So I'm going to have to throw in the quadratic equation. So x is equal to 16 plus or minus 16 squared minus 4 times 5 times 9, all divided by 2 times 5. I get my calculator out and I'm going to get 16 plus and minus the square root of 76 over 10. And so I'll give you a decimal approximation. So x is approximately equal to 0 0.728 and x is approximately equal to 2.47. Two. Okay, so now I've got all my critical points. My critical points were again when x is equal to 0, uh, 0 0.728, and 2.472. Now I can do this by a sign chart. So I can look to see based on the sign chart, and my factors are not going to be very nice, so I don't think I'm going to do it by a sign chart. So maybe I'm going to do it by the second derivative test. Second derivative test, so let's do the second derivative of my function. So that's going to give me 20x is equal to 20x cubed and uh, minus 3 times 16, so minus 48x squared. And then my last one is uh, 9 times 2 is 18, so plus 18x. Now, by the second derivative test, I'm going to put in 0. I end up with 0. So that tells me by the second derivative test that at uh, x equals 0 is inconclusive. Now I'm going to do f of 0.728, which is negative 4.619. And we know that if this is a negative, which is less than zero, we know that this is going to be a max. We don't know if it's the absolute or not. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then I'm gonna do f of 2.472. And we get a 53.29, so we might as well use two, three. 
which is obviously greater than zero, and this tells me that I have a minimum. What do we do about the inconclusive? Well, let's see what's happening on either, either side of zero. So I'm going to go back to my original derivative, which was f prime of x is equal to 5x, the quantity, what was it, 5x raised to the fourth power, minus, and it was 16x minus 16x cubed. And then we have plus, plus 9x squared. So plus 9x squared. Now I'm going to try to see what's happening on the one side of zero. So I'm going to choose f prime of, I'm going to choose something close to zero on the left hand side. So I'm going to choose maybe negative one. I put negative one in here. This is five plus 16. And then it's going to be plus nine. This is going to be a positive value. Then I'm going to choose something on the other side. Let's choose one. And so I have um, 5 minus 16 plus 9. This gives me a negative. So I think, well, wait a minute. Could that be, I'm coming in positive, I'm leaving negative. Mm. <sighs> Look at this here. I can't choose 1 because I have a critical point beyond that. So I can't choose 1. So what I have to choose is something less than 0.7 but bigger than zero, so I'll use 0.5. So using 0.5, I end up with, um, let's erase this. I end up with a positive number here. So that tells me my critical point, because I'm my, my slope is coming in positive at x is equal to zero, and then it's leaving positive. That tells me I'm probably doing some kind of slide there. That would be my guess as what happened in at zero. And that also tells me it's inconclusive. I found that it was inconclusive on my second derivative test, but what's happening is that critical point is not producing a maxima or a minima. Now let's talk about, we didn't talk, we didn't say whether or not these were absolute maxima or minimas. Let's go back to the original equation. My original equation is x to the fifth with a positive leading coefficient. Because my original graph is x to the fifth to positive leading coefficient, this is what the graph looks like. It's going on forever. And the left-hand side, we start out at negative infinity, and we end in the right-hand side. So this is my end behavior. That tells me that this max and this min are only local unless I looked at a particular interval. My, my graph of my original function, which was a polynomial of degree 5, it doesn't have an absolute minima and it doesn't have an absolute maxima because the degree is odd. So these are only going to be locals unless I'm looking at a, an interval. If I'm looking at an interval, these may be absolutes. It depends on what my interval is. Just a refresher for in one variable. In two variables, we're going to do something similar. So we say, let my function be two variables. B defined has to be continuous on an open set containing this point then it has a local maximum at that point if my output is larger than whatever's happening in that interval for all the points within this disk. And it has a local maximum value. So it's a local maximum value, which would be the z value. That would be the output that comes out. And of course, it holds for the point x any point x, y in the domain of f, then it is a global. If this holds true for all values in my domain, then it's a global maxima. And then, of course, this is how we're going to define the global minima. And, and then we have a minimum global minimum value as well as a local minimum value. So how do we figure this out? Well, let's give you some tools on figuring it out. So we get this little theorem. It says, let z be this two-variable function. It's going to be defined and continuous on some open set containing the point of interest, x0, y0. So if each one of my partial derivatives exists at the point of interest, if f has a local extrema at this point, then this is the critical point. Okay, well, it still isn't helping us how to find it. We're getting there. Now, there's a couple of things we want to talk about what happens when we have 
it's something that is a critical point, but it's neither a maxima or a minima. And we had that in our, our example. It was a, called it a horizontal slide. It means that we we're just going to continue on up. We found a critical point, but it, didn't, it wasn't a maxima or a minima. It wasn't an extrema. In three space, when this happens, so we're in x, y, and z, so I have a function of z in terms of x and y. We call this a saddle point. That means we get a, a critical point, but it is not relating to an extrema. This is a saddle point. This is an example of a saddle point. So it's neither a maxima or a minima. It's a saddle point. Okay, so if we have this function and we're looking at the point x naught, y naught, and my output of z, so it's a three-ordered pair, or it's an ordered triplet, it is a saddle point if both my partial derivatives are equal to zero, but it does not have an extrema. So this happens when I have a saddle point. Now, the one we had was our um, second derivative. It gave us that uh, indeterminate, and we looked at it, and we said, wait a minute, this is just horizontal slide. That's what it means in three space. So it, we have a critical point, but it isn't an extrema. Now we know from calculus one, we can do a sign chart. I didn't on this one. I went right to the second derivative test on my example when I was in one variable. Doing a sign chart in more than one variable is much harder to use or interpret. So we're just gonna go right to the second derivative test and we're gonna replace our second derivative evaluated at C as D, we call this the discriminant. So here is what we get. Our function z, which is a function of x and y, is two variables, first and second order derivatives that must be continuous, must be contained on some disk that includes this point. And we set our derivatives equal to zero. Then we're gonna define the, this d as the second derivative of my x with respect to x at that point, multiplied by my second derivative with, with respect to y at that point, minus my second derivative first with x, then y at that point squared. If this d value is greater than zero and my second derivative with respect to x, my partial is respect to x is greater than zero, then that is a local minimum. If my d value is greater than zero and my second derivative with respect to x is less than zero, then it's a maximum. If my d value is less than zero, then it's a saddle point, and if d equals zero, then it's inconclusive. So let's find our critical points and then determine if it's a min, max, saddle point, or none of these. So the first thing I need to do is my derivative with respect to x, my partial derivative, which is gonna be 2x minus six, and then I'm gonna do my partial derivative with respect to y, which is gonna give me 2y plus four. And I need to figure out what my ordered pairs are. And I know that um, 2x minus six has to equal zero. That means x is equal to three. And 2y plus four has to equal zero. That means I don't have to do two equations to unknowns because I can solve for x explicitly and also with y. So y equals negative 2. So my critical point is 3, negative 2. Now I have to decide what to do about that critical point. So I'm going to have to find my second derivative with respect to x, which is just 2. I also need my second derivative with respect to y which is just two. And I need my second derivative with respect to first x and then y, which gets me zero. Now, for this, there's no way I can do the evaluation because I have just constants and that's okay, but I can still use the equation d. So d is equal to my second derivative, which is two with respect to x, and then my second derivative with respect to y, which is also two, let me subscript that y, y. And then it's gonna be minus 
my second derivative with respect to x, the quantity squared, so this is 0 squared. Let me do this in color, make that 0 in green, because it was green is what we found that to be. Now, we know that this, we can tell, is greater than 0, so it's either case 1 or case 2. Then we have to go look at um, what my second derivative with respect to x is, which is this. And my second derivative with respect to x of x, y is equal to 2, which is greater than 0. So that means I am a case 1, which means this point is a local minimum. Let's take a look at our next example. So I'm going to find my partial derivative with respect to x, which gives me a 2y plus 3. And so this tells me 2y plus 3 is equal to 0. This tells me that y is equal to 3 halves, negative 3 halves. And then I'm going to do my second, my first derivative with respect to y, which is going to give me 2x plus 4. That gives me um, 2x plus 4 is equal to 0. x is equal to negative 2. So my critical point that I will be looking at then is negative 2 comma negative 3 halves. I need to do my second derivative. So my second derivative with respect to x is 0. Well, that's interesting. And my second derivative with respect to y is also 0. Now my last part is find my derivative with my second derivative with respect to y. So I need to find f of xy, xy, which is going to give me 2. So my d is equal to, well, 0 multiplied by 0, 0, because this is, my first 0 comes from the second derivative with respect to x. My second 0 comes with a derivative with respect to y, and then minus my derivative with respect to x, then y, 2 squared. We can see that this is less than 0. So this is a case 3, which tells me I have a saddle point. At negative 2 and negative 3 halves. And I'm going to go ahead and let you do the, the third one. So go ahead, pause it. I'm going to do the same thing I just did. And then I'll give you the answer. Welcome back. You have three critical points. First one is at negative 10, negative 5. And using my second derivative test, this tells me I'm at a local max. I have another critical point at 10, comma, uh, 5. This is a local min. And then... My last critical point, which I got to be, oh, actually, sorry, I have four critical points. So negative 10 comma 5 and positive 10 comma negative 5. These are saddle points. So hopefully you had lots of practice on part C, finding the first and second derivatives. Now, with our example, we talked about this earlier, that this particular polynomial does not have an absolute maxima or minima because the range is negative infinity to infinity. So the extremas that we found were local. If we contained the domain, if we restricted the domain on some closed or open interval, it wouldn't have mattered. Preferably closed, and we can talk about the endpoints. So in a closed interval, then we could find absolute maxima and minima. When we're working on two variables, we have a my closed interval becomes a bounded set. In other words, I'm looking at a disk in which I have the edges of the disk are going to be included. Here's a couple of more definitions I need. A continuous function on a closed and bounded set D in the plane attains an absolute maximum at some point and an absolute minimum at some point. So this is our first theorem. And we also get this. If we have this function of z, which is the function of x and y, is a differentiable function on two variables defined on a closed and bounded set, then my function will obtain an absolute minimum and an absolute maximum, 
which are the largest and smallest values found among all of the critical points or on the boundary. So find the absolute extrema on the given function of the indicated closed and bounded sets R. So the first thing I want to do is, of course, find my partial derivatives. So my partial derivative with respect to x, actually I'll write it as f, use the same notation as I was doing before, f of x, x, y, and we know this is going to be 2x. And then my partial derivative with respect to y, which is going to be 2y minus 2. We know this is going to give me x is equal to 0, and we know that this is going to be y is equal to um, 1. And so I have this critical point at 0, 1. And of course, we check to see whether or not this is a minimum. We don't know if it's an absolute or relative yet, so let's just assume it's local. So we're going to do our second derivatives, f of x, x, x of y is equal to 2, and f of y, y, x, y is equal to 2. So then also I need f of x, y of x, y is going to be 0, and so my d is going to be uh, 2 multiplied by 2 minus 0, which is greater than 0. So this looks like a case one situation. So this looks like case one because my d is greater than zero and my f of x, x is greater than zero. So this critical point we know is a minimum. Now we have to determine if it's an absolute minimum on this region or a relative minimum on this region. So to do this, what I have to do is I have to relate this region to this equation. So I'm going to start with this region. Now this region x squared plus y squared is equal to 4, I'm just going to put it as equal to 4 at the moment, is a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 4. And we know that x is equal to r cosine t. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to parameterize this so I can relate this region to this equation. So x equal r cosine t, t is my parameter. I could use theta, but I'm going to use t. My r was 2 because my radius, x squared plus y squared, gives me 4, tells me my radius is 2. So this is going to be 2 cosine of t. And then y is equal to r sine of t, which gives me 2 the sine of t. Now I've got replacements. I'm going to go back to the x squared, my original equation, x squared plus y squared minus 2y plus 1. Now x squared plus y squared can be replaced with 4 all day long, so this can be replaced with 4. Minus 2, my y is to the sine of t. And then I have plus 1. So I end up with 5 minus 4 the sine of t. That takes my function, which was a function of x and y, in terms of x of t comma y of t. So I have parameterized my original equation so I can relate it to my boundary condition. I'm going to go ahead and take my derivative of this, so of f prime of x of t, y of t, and since it's only in terms of t, so I'm going to do it with respect to t, this is going to give me negative 4 cosine of t. So I set this equal to 0. So I set this equal to 0. So negative 4 cosine of t is equal to 0. That means t must be equal to pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. So pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. So when I have my t is equal to pi over 2, so when t is equal to pi over 2, that tells me my r cosine of pi over 2, which is 2 times the cosine of pi over 2, my x value is 0. 
So for this, I get the ordered pair 0 and positive 2. And that's by putting pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 back into these equations here. Then I'm going to go ahead and find the 3 pi over 2. Well, the cosine of 3 pi over 2 is still 0. But the sine of 3 pi over 2 is going to be negative 1 multiplied by 2, so it's negative 2. So now I have these other values which are on the boundary of this disk, disk being included. So I have 0 and 2, 0 and negative 2. To determine what one is the largest or the smallest, I'm going to go back to the way I did it back in Calculus 1. Remember, when I was checking the boundary, I would put these values into my original function and determine what gets kicked out. So now that I've had these values on my boundary that is of interest, I'm going to do f of 0, 2 into my original equation. My original equation is x squared, so that's going to be 0 squared plus y squared, which is 2 squared, minus 2 multiplied by 2, plus 1. This gives me um, positive 1. Okay, cool. I'm also going to do f of 0, comma, negative 2. So I put in 0, and so that's the 0 squared, and then plus my y squared, which is negative 2 squared and then plus my 2 and then it's a plus because it's going to be a negative negative so let me just leave it as a negative to begin with so don't muddy the waters yet I'll do that later so minus so minus and then plus 1 this gives me 9 so clearly this number is larger than this number so this boundary which is 0 2 produces 1 this boundary 0, negative 2 produces 9. Cool. What does this produce? Well, let's go ahead and put in f of 0, 1. We know it's a minimum, but we don't know if it's smaller than 1 or if it's going to be bigger than 1 So as the output. So let's put in 0, 1. So this is 0 squared plus 1 squared minus 2 multiplied by 1 plus 1. And... I end up with, when I put in 0, I'm going to get um, 0. So this is my smallest output. Going back to here, this critical point is an absolute minimum on this disk. This is the largest number, which came from here. So this produces an absolute maximum. So the absolute maximum is 9 at that ordered pair, 0, negative 2, the absolute minimum is 0 at that ordered pair, 0, 1. So just like in calculus, when we talk about the absolute and the relatives, we tell you in two things. We tell you what it is. The absolute minimum is 0 at this ordered pair, and the absolute max is 9 at this point. So we have found our absolutes on this closed region. This may not have had absolutes if it wasn't on a closed region. So let's take a look. Let me move all of this. I don't know why that's not moving. So let me take a look at all of this over here. Move this out of the way. Let's take a look at our next example. And we're going to do the same kind of thing. Is we're going to find our critical points first. And then we're going to look at the boundary. We're going to use the same kind of parameterization to make one relate to the other. x is equal to, still going to be r cosine t all day long. My radius is equal to 2, so this is going to be similar. So 2 to the cosine of t is a nice replacement. And y is equal to r sine of t, so again a nice replacement of 2, the sine of t. So as before, I'm going to put those in there so I can relate my boundary to my function. So go ahead and pause this and uh, come back in a moment and I'll tell you what the answers are. Welcome back. So at the x point of 0 comma 1, um, I have an absolute min 
of negative 1. At 0, comma, negative 1, I have an absolute max of 1. So those are the answers for B. I do the same thing as I did before. Step by step, the first thing I do is I'm going to do my first derivative and my second derivative. First derivative tells me my critical points. My second derivative tells me what the critical points I expect them to be, whether or not they're absolutes, or excuse me, whether or not they're maxes, minimums, or saddled points. I need to then relate my disk to my original function, so I parameterize. After I parameterize, I get a function of t only, and then I do the derivative of that. And then I solve for that, so the values of t. Then I get, once I find values of t, I put them back into these two equations, these two equations, which allows me to figure out what the x and y values are. And then, of course, once I figure out what my x and y values are, then I put them back into my original equation and see what my outputs are. And from there, I determine whether or not I have absolutes or not. Now, the reason we do any of these is really to get to the applications. So let's talk about the applications. We have a manufacturing types, two types of athletic shoes, jogging shoes, and cross trainers. Here's the equation of the revenue where x and y are thousands of units. Find the values of x and y that maximize the total revenue. What they're asking for you to do then is to do your derivatives with respect to x and y. So that's all they're asking you for. They're not telling you on a certain interval or anything, so we're not looking at um, a disk. So I'm going to do r of x with respect to x, and I end up with a negative 10x minus 2y plus 42. And then my r of y, xy, which gives me negative 16y minus 2x plus 102. I have two equations and two unknowns, so I'm going to solve my usual two equations and two unknowns. And I end up with the ordered pair 3 comma 6. Go ahead and check that. So now I'm going to do my second derivative, so r with respect to x a second time, it's going to give me negative 10. r with respect to y a second time, it's going to give me negative 16. To find my d, I need my negative 10, which I have, my negative 16, which I have, minus. I also need my first derivative with respect to x, and then a second derivative with respect to y which is given me negative 2, so negative 2, the quantity squared. And we can see the double negatives here, 10 times 16 double negatives, a fairly large number, which is going to dominate minus 4, so we know that this thing is greater than 0. The other thing that I need is I need to determine what's happening here. Now this is obviously less than 0. These two combined tell me that this point, my critical point, is a maximum. So that tells me at x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 6, you will maximize the revenue. Obviously not spelled right. Okay, let's take a look at the second example. The second example, find the maximum volume of a cylindrical soda such that the sum of its height and circumference is 120. First, we know the volume is equal to pi r squared, where r is the radius, h is the height. That's going to be true all day long. The circumference is equal to 2 pi r, so we need 2 pi r plus h to be equal to 120. So that tells me that h is equal to 120 minus 2 pi r. That allows me to replace this here, so all of v. So v is equal to pi r squared, 120 minus 2 pi r. So I end up with my v is equal to, well, I'll just leave it like that. 
So if I want to do my derivative with respect to r, so my dv and dr, my dv with respect to r is going to be equal to um, 2 pi r multiplied by 120 minus 2 pi r plus, I'm going to do it by the product rule because I'm feeling a little bit lazy. And so then plus, it's going to be pi r squared multiplied by a negative 2 pi. Now, this is going to give me my critical point, so I'm going to set this thing equal to 0 and solve. So I can factor out a pi r. Yeah, I'm going to factor out a pi r. Leaving me 2 multiplied by 120 minus 2 pi r. And then plus, oh, that'd be a minus. And then minus 2 pi squared r. And it is equal to 0. And so I get r is equal to 0. And then I clean this up and I get r is equal to 40 divided by pi. Now, of course, r equals to 0 makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So I believe my r is going to be 40 divided by pi. So I would now need to determine whether or not this is a maxima or a minima. So I'd need to find my second derivative. So v double prime is going to be equal to, well, it's going to be the derivative of my first one, which is going to be 2 pi 120 minus 3 pi r plus 2 pi multiplied by negative 3. Now I'm going to evaluate this evaluate this at r is equal to 40 divided by pi. And when that happens, I end up with a negative 6 pi, which is less than 0. And that tells me that that is a max then. If I go back to my calculus 2, this tells me that that is a max when my second derivative is less than 0. So what are we asked to do? Find the maximum volume of the cylinder. So to find my maximum volume, I found the R value that produces the maximum volume. So my volume would be pi. My R is 40 divided by pi, the quantity squared, multiplied by H. And to find my H, I would have to put this value back into here to find my H which I believe it's 40. And so my maximum volume when I get totally done is going to be something like, oh, 64,000 over pi cubic centimeters. And that is my final answer. That's it.